Okay, I think it's going to work. Fingers crossed. All right, well, thank you all for having me back. I'm Vinay Prasad. I'm a faculty member here. I attend uh, in hematology and hemonc clinic on Mondays, and I'm on service three months a year. It's nice to see you all. This is the second time we're doing this. All right, so I'm going to talk about, is this the last lecture of the day, too? Oh, okay, great. Well, I'm sorry to keep you, so we got to get done in time. All right, so we're going to talk about great and crazy things in medicine. All right, so that's the purpose of this talk. Now, I always want to start by saying, you know, we do a lot of great things in oncology, and I think we should always remember um, how important the service we provide is, particularly for our patient population, and particularly a lot of the work that you all do on 4C and on the, on the floors. So what are the things I think that we do in oncology that have the most value for our patients? I think it's provide comfort. You know, we underestimate the value of caring, but for so many of our patients, we might be the only sympathetic ear they get to talk to that day. For many people, we provide guidance, what to expect, what might come next, um, what will be the future for their disease. And then for some patients, we also give good drugs. We give therapies that extend their life, reduce their pain, help them live longer and feel better. And so I think it's important to remember that caring for the patient is probably the most important thing we do here at the General. This is an example of one of the great drugs we give. All right, this is the story of one drug, one disease, and a few decades in Sweden. So let me walk you through this. See, it says, female, 55 years old. This is a 55-year-old woman, okay, and a story of what happened to this woman in Sweden over the last few decades. So right here, this arrow shows you in 1974, a 55-year-old woman is diagnosed with chronic myeloid leukemia in Sweden. And the yellow line is telling you how long she expects to live. So she's 55, some doctor told her she has CML, and as you can see, it looks like about three to, five, three to four years. You know, the yellow line is three to four years of survival. The blue line, that's how long the same 55-year-old woman would have lived if she didn't get the CML diagnosis, if she was otherwise healthy, okay? It would be 27 years, 20-some years. That was her life expectancy in Sweden. And this gap between the blue and the yellow is what we think about as years of life lost. So this diagnosis is so devastating, she's losing like 20 years of her life, okay? This is, I think this is what we worry about with cancer. So many cancers are like this. A 30-year-old gets colon cancer, there's a huge 30-year, maybe 40-year gap of years of life lost. Something happens over time. That same 55-year-old woman, if she's diagnosed in 2010, her years of life lost, the gap is almost entirely closed. So why did it close? What was the reason? And the answer is one pill, imatinib. Imatinib is Gleevec. Sometimes our patients take Desatinib or Nilotinib. We have a lot of patients taking this medication. Gabriella sees a lot of them. Um, this single-handedly did this. It turned a disease that was a death sentence into something where you almost live a normal and full life. And I think this is what we want in oncology. Now, some of you may note that the curve actually starts to bend upwards in the years before imatinib comes out. And there's a reason that happens. It's because from here to here, there's no drug development, and the curve is getting a little bit better because of improvements in supportive care, palliative care, better antibiotics. The curve starts to bend upwards in the late 1990s because of imatinib, even though the imatinib is not out yet, some of these people diagnosed in 1996 are still alive by chance in 2001, and they start taking imatinib, and their life expectancy is so transformed that it even starts to pull up the average in the people diagnosed in the years before. But some people diagnosed in 1996, unfortunately, they died already, and they can't benefit from imatinib. So the drug is so transformative, it even distorts the curve for people diagnosed in the years prior. All right, so remember this. This is the story I think we want to see. Life expectancy is going up, why does the blue go up? Life expectancy goes up in all developed nations, except, except for the US the last five years. It's kind of on the way down. But it typically goes up, and medicine corrects the gap. All right. But even this great drug is extremely costly. At its peak, I think it costs something like $120,000 a year for Matinib. When it debuted on the cover of Time magazine, it said magic bullets for cancer, but can we afford it? Because when it debuted, it was $30,000. We thought that was unsustainable. Now $30,000, we think it's a deal. We'll take four of those, you know? Now we're paying $250,000 for a new drug, or $400,000 for a one-time infusion of CAR T-cells. So we're paying unsustainable prices. This is a figure from a paper we did a few years ago where we show you two lines that tell a story of America, really, really a profound story of America. The red line 
is the median monthly household income that a family makes adjusted for inflation. So basically it shows you like how much you might make on average in America, that's per month, that's the red line. And you can see despite all this productivity boost, wages have stagnated. Okay, the blue line tells you the median cost for one month of a cancer drug in America. And it starts at $25 a month, then $100 a month. 1999 was an important year. We had paclitaxel, the first billion dollar a year cancer drug. People didn't think a cancer drug could ever make a billion dollars a year because cancer is not that common. You need to be heartburn or high cholesterol to make a billion dollars. What they didn't think was that we would crank up the price so much that even rare diseases would be billion dollar a year drugs. So this was 1999 paclitaxel. And since then it's up and up and up. This was $10,000 per month of therapy for cancer drug. That was 10 years ago. Now it's 20,000, 25,000. We just looked one up today, $28,000 per month of therapy, lenvantinib. These are unsustainable prices. And so, you know, the story of America is that people in their pockets, they're not feeling any richer, but they're just drowning in healthcare costs and healthcare premiums. And we pay 20% of our economy is in healthcare now. So there are great things we do, but there are also crazy things we do. Imatinib is the greatest thing we do. It costs too much. Now it's come down a little bit because of generics, but we do too many crazy things, I think, which is that imatinib works really well if you have CML, but we took that model, we extrapolated it to everything else. We're giving too many unproven medications. Even at a place like the general, sometimes I see somebody has a cancer, there is no approved drug for that cancer. We send out foundation medicine and it sends us a report and it says, well, they might benefit, they could benefit from some $200,000 a year drug and we bend heaven and earth to get that drug. But the reality is, I'll show you, they don't often benefit. And sometimes I ask myself, why are we spending $200,000 for this drug when for $50,000 you can get somebody to come to this person's house every day and check in on them? And wouldn't that be a much better use of the money? Or somebody to give them a ride to the appointments or somebody to help keep their calendar. That's what we don't want to pay for, but we'll pay for the drug. A few years ago, I saw all the experts on stage and they were saying things like this. We've reached an inflection point. There are breakthroughs around the bend where the number of discoveries that are being made has accelerate, at such an accelerated pace are saving lives and bringing enormous hope. Or this could be an inflection point in our ability to treat and even cure many intractable illnesses. When I hear the word inflection point, I think to myself that if you were to look at the use of these drugs over time, you'd see something starts to change recently. You know, maybe it was slow and steady in the beginning, but now it's taking off. That's what it sounds like to me. So we got curious and we ran the numbers. We looked at all of these genomic drugs over time. There's two lines here. The blue line tells you of all the people in America, what percent would benefit from these, sorry, what percent would be eligible for these drugs. And the yellow and the, I guess, reddish orange line on this screen, the reddish orange line tells you what percent of people have their cancer shrink more than 30%. Okay. And this is year over year, all these drug approvals over two decades. And the story here is, I'm looking for that inflection point, but I don't see it. I don't see it taking off. I see, I see progress, sure, but it's slow and steady. All right, no exponential growth, no inflection points, about you know, half a percentage point per year. So in my career, you know, which has now been about 10 years in oncology, and just before my career, I heard a lot of tall tales. So this was when I was, I think in high school, to the end of high school, New York Times. Judah is gonna cure cancer in two years said James Watson, the co-discoverer of the structure of DNA. This is in the New York Times, that we're just two years away. We're gonna cure cancer. It didn't happen, sadly. In 2015, von Eschenbach said that, well, he, no, by 2015, he said, we will eliminate suffering and death due to the disease of cancer. And of course, again, you know, we hear these unrealistic promises. So I think our patients are in a tough spot. They're kind of always hearing that cancer is gonna get cured any day now, but the reality is that figure I showed you, it's a slow, steady slog. I mean, it's progress, but it's incremental progress. It's hard fought progress, you know? So a few years ago, I was looking on the internet and I saw MD Anderson had this figure. This is what they said, the future is here. MD Anderson, you know, their slogan is making cancer history. And they have a line through the cancer saying it's gone, you know? And I had some patients who kept getting second opinions at MD Anderson. I was getting a little fed up with MD Anderson because they're, they're saying a lot of things I don't think are true. I saw this slide that they put out. The slide basically shows the future. You get all these people with cancer. We're gonna do all this molecular profiling, you know, foundation medicine. I don't know, somebody gonna be putting a lot of pipetting. 
They do a lot of pipetting and they get all these results. It's probably what they're doing right above our heads here in this building. You know, they're doing all this stuff. And then they're going to find that this person, you know, this red person, this is a kidney cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, but they all got something in common. This yellow person, you know, they all got something in common. And we're going to give drugs that just target those mutations perfectly, like a lock and a key. And look at them. He's going to take the pink pill, the blue pill, the red pill. Like, you know, we got you covered. Whatever mutations you have, this is the future. The same year that they put this figure out, they published a paper of their own molecular profiling at MD Anderson. And in their paper, they told us, for every 100 people you take, how many can you match on a pill? This figure tells me for every 100 people you take, on, you take, 100% of people get the pill. That's what the figure is telling me. That's what the public is seeing. I remade the figure for the actual numbers that they report in their paper the same year they post the figure. And this is what their figure should have been. It should have looked like this. Because they weren't even close. Only 6.3% to 6.4% of people could even be paired with the drug. 94% of people, they didn't even find a match. And yet they're putting out that rhetoric, which is, I think, incredibly misleading. Misleading the public, misleading the patients, misleading, and, and, and it bleeds into the doctor's office. Because I tell the patient, you need chemotherapy with bendamustine rituximab or something like that. They say, isn't, isn't there a pill for me? I said, you know, I know why you got that idea. <laughs> but no, not yet. Okay. So what do I think? Crazy things we do. We've got transformative drugs, but we give too many unproven medications. We sequence somebody, we find out you have the mutation, we just give you the drug assuming it's gonna work, but it was never tested in that tumor type. It was tested in colon or lung, and we're extrapolating it, extrapolating it to cervical cancer or endometrial cancer. We're making a leap. We don't have evidence for that. We give costly and toxic drugs that may not work. These drugs are costing $28,000 a month now. They're costly and they are toxic. We may not call them chemotherapy, but some of these pills, they make your hands and your feet ache. We have all seen that. We've had so many patients come to me, they throw the pills in my face and they say, why are you give me this pill? It's terrible. You know, we've all had that happen. All right. I think one thing we make a mistake of, even at this hospital, we keep radiating people over and over and again, even when, and, and give them additional courses of chemotherapy, even when we think it is futile, I think. We do that because I think that's a tough part. A wise person once told me early in my career, it's a lot more difficult to tell someone they're dying than to give them more chemotherapy. You know, it's a lot easier to give them chemo, but it's harder to have the honest conversations. I think we continue drugs when the tumor is already growing. Once somebody has progressive disease, we typically stop those drugs, but sometimes people want to keep giving them, but you're just adding toxicity. And I don't think there's often evidence to continue to give them. We screen for cancer and people who don't want to be bothered. I'm going to talk about that. We stop treatment because we want to do fertility preservation. I'm going to talk about that. And then I think the worst thing we do in oncology, in medicine, is when we're scared and afraid, we panic. And when we panic, we make bad, de we make bad decisions. All right, so a few years ago, I was at that conference. And at the conference, when I go there, I hear, boy, I, you think cancer's cure, the way they talk about this conference. You know, the way they're talking about it all the time. And they're talking about the game changer drugs that are coming out. They're saying we got all these new drugs and they're game changers. I said, the game has changed? What game, what game were we playing? And the example they like to give is the inhibitors of ALK lung cancer. Now don't get me wrong. Years ago, I was taking care of a woman who came in comatose and we found out she had brain metastases. We biopsied them, they were ALK rearranged, brain metastases. We took lorlatinib, we powdered it up, we put it down the NG tube and she woke up. So these drugs can be remarkable, but for the average person, do they change the game? Do they take a disease that was once lethal and do what imatinib did, make it almost normal life expectancy? That's a question I had. So I took the same situation, these ALK drugs, that everyone was telling me was a game changer, and we put them all, crizotinib, seritinib, elictinib, brigatinib, lorlatinib, we put them all, it's hard to pronounce, they put them all on this thing, and then I made the same figure that I showed you for imatinib, that yellow line closing the blue line, they're touching at the end, I made the exact same figure for a hypothetical 55-year-old woman who takes all of these drugs in a row. So the drugs are free, we're giving them to the patient. Same figure, okay? You saw what imatinib does. Now let me show you what people call a game changer, okay? All the drugs for this disease, different disease. That's what it looks like. Okay, so is there progress? Yeah, there's progress. Like, it was stagnation for 20 years, and now at last we're trying to improve survival a little bit. But has the game changed? 
the years of life lost is still 20 plus years of life. I mean, you're still telling somebody who's in middle age that they're going to be dead soon. These drugs will eventually stop working. So I think it's a little bit arrogant for a doctor to say that this is a game changer when the patient's not going to say that. The patient still has a devastating diagnosis. And so that's one of the things, one of the big problems I have with the profession is that we seem to forget how much life we're still losing. A few years ago, I did this paper with David Benjamin. He's a doctor in uh, Newport Beach now. He used to be a fellow at UC Irvine. It's called, Are We Closing the Gap in Years of Life Lost? And here's what motivated me. I was going to the lung cancer clinics, and in lung cancer clinic, they would say, good news. Good news, Dr. Prasad. I said, what good news? And they said, the patient has EGFR mutation lung cancer. Or good news, the patient has ALK rearranged lung cancer. I say, well, it's kind of good news because you have a pill you can give them. You know, you're not going to give them pembrolizumab and pemetrexid and carboplatin like we often, we often give patients who are smokers, who have smoking-related lung cancer. This is typically younger, Asian, non-smoker, targetable mutation on a pill. So they say, good news. And I said, you know, but that really does kind of strike the wrong chord with me because this person still is, has cancer. So, I mean, what you mean to say is you have more options, but I'm not necessarily com comfortable saying this is good news. But yet, that's what people said. And they said it for a reason, and this is the reason they said it. That if you took the, the median, this is the median duration of response, or something called cumulative median duration response, a simple way to think about it is, this is pretty much how, how much good time you have after you've been diagnosed with the cancer. All right. And if you have smoking-related lung cancer, which is typically shown in the green here, you got about one year on average in the most recent studies. But depending on what mutation you have, you got that ROS1 mutation at the bottom, the median duration of response from all the drugs in a row is like 6.2 years. So the reason that you know, the fellows and the residents and even some of the other attendings say good news is, well, this bar is bigger than that bar. You know, It's relatively good news. But the part of the thing that they forgot when they say this is that the person who gets smoking-related lung cancer the average age is 71. But is the person who get ROS1 rearranged lung cancer 71 on average? So I had David Benjamin look that up, and this is what he found. The blue bar shows you the average age somebody told you you had that diagnosis. Here it's shown in green for the smoking-related lung cancers. These are typically more smoking-related. These are also can be smoking-related, but don't get me wrong, but often present in somebody who's never smoked. And the orange bar shows you the combined effect of all the drugs in a row. So they're saying good news because look at this orange. It's so much bigger than that orange over here. But what they're forgetting is the person you're telling that to got cancer at a median age of 53 and not 71. And the years of life lost is much bigger for that young person. So it's actually not good news. In fact, it's tragic news. And even though we've spent billions and billions on drug development and billions on these pills per year, we haven't even begun to close the gap. You don't even live as long as somebody who has smoking-induced lung cancer on average. You're still losing maybe a decade of life. So to me, to call this game changers, to say good news, this is all broken rhetoric of a system that's forgotten you know, what the point of this all is. And sometimes people tell me, oh, you're a glass half empty person. You know? You're not an optimist, you're a pessimist. I say, the truth is I'm an optimist. I'm a glass half full person, but it's not half full. You know? It's mostly empty. All right, so that's the problem. It's got a little water in there, okay. And the truth is, if you look at consecutive drug approvals in a row, the story's even more sobering. These are just 71 drugs approved in a row. And what you find is the median improvement in progression-free survival on the top is 2.3 months, and the median improvement in overall survival is 2.1 months. There's so many missing bars because we just don't know how long people live with those cancers and, or those drugs. So to me, the great thing we do in oncology is we provide comfort. The great thing we do is we take care of people and we answer their questions and we provide care. The great thing we do is we prescribe some drugs that cure people. I mean, we've cured people here with chemotherapy, with CHOP. We've cured people with breast cancer, adjuvant chemotherapy. We've given people imatinib here. The bad thing we do is that sometimes we inflate the benefit of things that don't work so well. We live in a sea of hype. The conference is driven by hype. The influence of the industry is maybe too much. And we lack perspective sometimes. All right. So any questions on that? I'm going to talk about something different in a second. So I don't know. Any thoughts on the drugs we're giving, the price? Some work great, but not all of them. The average is more modest. All right. 
moment. We screen people who just want to be left alone. Now, years ago, I was working in a lung cancer clinic, and I heard the story of a guy who had had lung cancer screening, and he got many, many cancers, and we treated him many, many times, and this is his story. All right. So I wrote about this in an online magazine we run called Sensible Medicine. And basically I say he was the most improbable 74-year-old. He's 74 years old. He was thin, rail thin, in part because he was a smoker. He wasn't an ordinary smoker. He smoked three to four packs a day for most of his life. And he started smoking when he was like 14. He's got something like 200 or 300 pack years under his belt. He's not just a little smoker, he's a heavy smoker. And age had not slowed him down one bit. He still was smoking four packs a day when I met him. And he had a cigarette from the moment he woke up till probably it, it, it extinguished after he fell asleep. Okay, that's how much he's smoking. <laughs> And what did he do? He had no children. He has no wife. He has no spouse. He has no loved ones. He has no aunts, no uncles, no cousins, nothing. He lives alone in rural Oregon. And he has a little house just outside of town, Portland. And what does he like to do? Work on cars. So all he does is like to go into the car and work on it, have a few cigarettes. That's the joy in his life. That's all he wants to do. Maximize how much time he can still work on his car. And I kind of find there's some appeal to that. I mean, you know, for each their, to each their own, but I think there's some appeal to working on your car. It's a very satisfying thing. Okay. He comes in to see the doctor. Doctor says, you gotta have a colonoscopy, you're too old. He says, how do you do that colonoscopy there? And then he says, ah, no thank you, I'm not, I'm not gonna do that col Oh, wh that's how you do it? No way, forget that. Well, he says, well, you also need to get CT screening for lung cancer. He says, how do you do the CT screening for lung cancer? They're like, oh, it's not like that colonoscopy, you just lay there and they just scan you. He's like, you're not, it's not invasive? Not invasive. All right, I'll do it, you know? So they talked him into doing it. Did he really understand what he was getting into? I don't know, he just knew it wasn't a colonoscopy. And, and like so many patients, you probably want to meet the doctor halfway. Doctor wants you to do two things, you really don't want to do one. You feel a little bad sometimes. I'll meet you halfway, I'll do one of the two. He gets the CT scan done. There's several concerning spots on the CT scan. So we follow him with another CT scan and then a PET scan. And then three of them started to get bigger. And so we do needle biopsy of the three. And one is cancer. And so we say, oh my God, you got cancer. We got to do another PET CT, stage you. We got to do endobronchial ultrasound. You do have cancer. He's getting, obviously, he's very worried. This is going to kill me. We cut it out. We give him four months of adjuvant chemotherapy to try to rid him of the cancer. And then we put him back on the scanning train. We scan him again three months later and three months later and three months later. And then now another nodule starts to grow. And this time we biopsy it and it's actually a more aggressive cancer, small cell cancer. But we caught it early. But we get re he gets you know, really nervous. And then they cut it out. They give radiotherapy and they give him more chemotherapy. Now, I'm already asking myself, what's the evidence for more chemotherapy in a guy who's already gotten chemotherapy? I don't think there's studies that show that, but they already gave him more chemotherapy. Then he comes back again. There's a third nodule growing. The biopsy again, it's a, yet a different cancer. And the surgeon's telling me, well, when are you gonna give him chemotherapy the third time? And I said, three times, how many times do you have to give chemotherapy before we say maybe this is not gonna respond to chemotherapy? You know? All right. So. We don't have evidence to give people adjuvant over and over and over again, but people do it. And actually the real question is, that started this whole thing, was is he better off by getting screening for lung cancer? I mean, we did that to him. We brought him into this picture. He used to tell me, before I met a doctor, I never had a problem. And it's true. Before he met a doctor, he never had a problem. We gave him the problem. We told him he had the spot. He didn't feel it. He didn't have a symptom. We told him. And we did that because we promised him by doing this, you'll be better off. That's a promise, that's an implicit promise. Do we have evidence for that? And actually, if you take a look at the best evidence on lung cancer screening, and we've done a lot of work on this, this is one of the two seminal studies, the biggest study that had a screening versus no screening at all, and these are the results. If you get lung cancer CT screening, your risk of death, the absolute percentage of death, went from two to three percent. So you lose, you reduce your risk of death by one percentage, dying from lung cancer. But people don't care just about dying from lung cancer. They care about everything in life. They care about what if you try to cut out my lung and then the lung drops and I die from the surgery? What if you give me chemotherapy and I get leukemia from the chemotherapy? What about that? So if you start to look at death from all other cancers, there's an imbalance the other direction. The group that got screened is blue. They're actually doing a little bit worse than the group that didn't get screened. And then if you look at the gold standard, in my opinion, which is are you alive or dead for any reason at all, 13% of people had died, which is a lot. 
but these are heavy smokers, you know, mostly heart disease, to be honest with you. And there's no difference between whether or not you get screened or not. And if you look at the other study, NLST, it's no longer statistically significant for overall survival. It's lost that too. If you pull them all together, there's no survival benefit. Michael Brethauer recently took all the screening tests that we were offering and he asked a simple question, which is the patient said, by doing this screening test versus not doing it, how many days of life might, be, might I be adding to my life? And what he finds is, for mammography, it looked like a wash, an FOBT, a wash. Sigmoidoscopy was the only one that looked mostly favorable, but we're talking on average, you know, something between 90 and 180 days. But lung cancer CT screening, it's so wide because it's so uncertain. We don't really know what we're doing. So what's my point about lung cancer CT screening? My point is that I don't feel like we do a good enough job of telling people honestly that we don't know for sure this is going to make you live longer or live better. We just make them do it. We don't really have a discussion. We have a busy palm nodule clinic here where we just got following people in perpetuity. And some of these people following a lung nodule is, in my opinion, the least important thing of their lives. We're spending all this money on CT scans. Some of these patients would be much more important for stable housing, somebody to check up on them, somebody to help them do dishes, somebody to help them get clean, somebody to give them a place to live, somebody to give them a break, somebody to give them a job. And the last thing you want to do is follow some nodule in perpetuity. But it's easy to get PET CTs paid for and nodule programs paid for. But what about what actually matters to people? I think we've forgotten the whole story. So I'm skeptical of a lot of screening. People ask me, are you going to get screening? I had the same reaction he had when he heard about that colonoscopy. So I was like, I don't know. how you do that? I was like, oh, I, don't, I don't know about that. OK. How you, oh, OK. All right. So fertility preservation. A lot of our patients are of reproductive age. And we're going to give some chemotherapy. And I'm getting ready to order the chemotherapy. You're getting ready to hang the chemotherapy. We're all getting ready to give it. And somebody says, oh, no, they got to go get their fertility preserved. I say, what the heck are we doing? Fertility preservation. So a few years ago, we got very interested in the question. We know two things about fertility preservation. It delays treatment. It delays treatment, that's for sure, because you got to go do it. And then the question I had was, well, do they have more babies? What's the point of it? The point of it, presumably, is that at the end of the day, you will have more babies by doing it than if you didn't do it. So then I asked a very wise person, Chris Eden, who's a medical student at OHSU. I said, go and look at all the literature and tell me, do they have more babies? And he came back to me and he made this figure. And the figure shows a blue bar and a red bar. And one bar is showing you how many babies people have when, no, I'll show you the figure first. <laughs> Percent of participants who were able to become pregnant. Intervention, they did fertility preservation, they didn't. And I don't see much of a difference here. So to me, why do I pick on fertility preservation? Not because I oppose it in principle. I think it could be, maybe it's useful. But it's one of those things we do that just sounds good. It, it's a feel-good thing to do, that you would refer somebody and they would give you hormones and, I don't know, collect some sperm and collect eggs or, you know. It feels plausible that that would be a good thing to offer. And then they'd freeze it and one day you'd want it and they'd thaw it out and you might have to pay $1,000 a month to keep it frozen or something. But at the end of the day, the question is, before we do anything in medicine, well, does it actually result in the thing you think? Do they have more babies? And there's just no evidence for that. There's just no evidence that they have more progeny, no evidence of this. And so I ask myself, what are we doing? We either need to get them. This is a billion dollar service. I mean, people are spending billions to keep you know, freezers and freezers full of embryos and, 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 and eggs and sperm. But what, but what happens to it? You know, we don't know. And so I always ask myself, I guess, how does it affect my practice? I think some of the chemotherapy regimens are less likely to damage fertility than people believe. And some diseases are more lethal than people think. So I'm much less likely to wait for fertility preservation. I'm much more likely to just give the treatment and say, I, you know, I can't afford to wait. One, you've never proven to me to have more kids. Two, this is an important thing we've got to treat right now. And three, I'm pretty convinced that even if they treat and survive, they'll actually be able to have kids naturally. Which is the reason why there's a wash, because some people are not doing anything. They're still able to have kids naturally. Because the body is resilient. OK. Advertisement. This is a crazy country where I was listening to the radio in the back of an Uber. And it said, uh, ask your doctor about eye brands. If you have hormone receptor positive breast cancer, metastatic, ask your doctor about palbocyclib. And I said, who are, I mean, to pay for a radio ad? <laughs> You know, of a thousand people on listening to the radio, what percent have hormone receptor positive, non-HER2 negative, 
<laughs> breast cancer, getting adjuvant. I mean, what it tells you is if you can advertise to everybody for the one in 10,000 people listening who might be eligible, your product costs too damn much. You're making so much money from your drug, you can justify an advertisement campaign to just random people in the hope that one in a million is gonna buy your drug, which pays for the whole ad campaign. That's how much money you're charging for your drug. You know, that's the gist. So I was listening to this, I thought it was crazy. But we're one of the only two countries on earth that have direct to consumer advertisements for prescription drugs. The European countries don't allow it. If you want a prescription drug, you gotta go to the doctor and talk to them. Only this country will say, ask your doctor, you have non-small cell lung cancer, ask your doctor about pembrolizumab. I was like, okay, jeez. What's the other country? New Zealand. New Zealand. So a few years ago, I was looking through, well, when I go to the conference every morning, I'm lucky. When I open the doorknob, somebody's hung a bag on my doorknob full of trash. But that trash are advertisements they want me to look at. So I put it in the recycling bin, but once in a while, a, pe a page tumbles out, and I see the ad, and this was the ad I saw. It said, final overall survival results from Radiant 3. And it shows this person getting Affinitor, which is a drug I don't like. I think it's very toxic. And it shows that if you don't get Affinitor, you have this survival, and if you do, you live this much longer. And they shade it in the difference, so you can't miss it. So there's a difference right there. All right, I was looking at this, I was like, oh, huh, I didn't know they had final results out. Looking promising, looks really good. And I said, what's this? This is a little asterisk there at the bottom. What's that say at the bottom? It says, not statistically significant, but clinically meaningful. Huh. So you're saying that it's actually no difference is what you're saying. You're saying it's not statistically significant. But if it were, it would have mattered. But it's not. It actually, it's not. It's actually, there was no difference there. But, so, but if it were, it would have been good. But it's not. So <laughs> I thought to myself, this is crazy. This is a new low. And they tricked me because I had to look really small. And I actually made this bigger. It's actually much, much smaller. I could barely see it. All right, I'm going to skip. Well, I'll skip that. A few years ago, we got really interested. I had kept hearing the same words over and over again. I heard cancer drug is a home run. It's a miracle. It's a game changer. It's a revolution. It's a cure. And so we took all those words. I, had a, I asked another student at the time, Andrew Oserin, I said, take all those words and look them all up. And so every time they say cancer drug breakthrough, cancer drug miracle, tell me what those drugs are. And he made a list of the drugs and say breakthrough, miracle, game changer, groundbreaking, game changer, miracle, miracle, groundbreaking. And then I said, look up those drugs and tell me what you know about them. He says 50% are not approved by the FDA. And 14% were only given to a mouse. And I say it might be a breakthrough for that mouse, <laughs> but not for my patients. All right. I guess the last thing I think is, I think our, our media coverage of health is fundamentally crazy. They are, I think, no offense, but I think that they're increasingly disconnected from America, the people who work in these newsrooms. They live very elite lives. They don't know what's going on in America. They don't know what the average American's going through. I think some of their coverage around the pandemic was so disconnected from where the rest of us are. Um, and their health coverage is crazy. So here's an actual article from the New York Times health coverage. It says, are saunas good for the brain? Is a sauna good for the brain? I was like, well, I don't know a lot of people got regular access to a sauna, <laughs> all right? But uh, the ones I do know, my, uh, probably doing pretty well. And then I was like, well, is a Rolls Royce good for the brain? I mean, as long as you, if you're driving a Ferrari, good for the brain, and eating caviar might be good for the brain. Who knows, saunas are good for the brain. Having a guest bedroom is good for the brain too. When you can see how that works in this study. All right, so the study basically found that people who regularly use a sauna are 60% less likely to develop Alzheimer's disease than those who seldom use a sauna. <laughs> and then I asked myself, in this data set from Finland, it turns out there are a few things that are true. The people who use the sauna the least use it between zero to one time a week. And the people who use it the most use it more than one time a day. So who in America uses a sauna more than one time a day. Because <laughs> these, are, these are Finnish people. They live in the sauna. When I was in Finland, they told me that there are so many saunas in Finland that everybody could go in the sauna simultaneously, and there's still space for a few visitors. They still got space in their sauna. All right, so this is not anything to do with America. And, and the magnitude of the benefit, it's 60. You're, two, you're only one-third as likely to get Alzheimer's. It blew me away. 
Because I knew there was a mutation called APOE, and it's a genetic mutation that increases your risk of Alzheimer's, but even that is only 16%. So a sauna is so good, it's like three times as good, four times as good as genetic mutations that cause Alzheimer's. The other thing that's strange is we found nothing to prevent Alzheimer's, but the sauna does it. Oh, I told you this. Compared men who use the sauna once per week to six to seven times per week, these are different people. And they have nothing to do with America. So do I believe it? No. The next thing I saw, the best sport for a longer life, try tennis. I was like, tennis is a unique sport. It's different than running. To run, all you need are shoes and a sidewalk, maybe, you know, or a trail. To bike, all you need is a bicycle, okay? But to play tennis, you need a few things, especially in San Francisco. One, you need a racket, okay? You need the balls. You need a partner to play with, and you need to book a tennis court. And if some of you all know how to book that tennis court on that app, you can help me out with that, because it's not so easy. So you have to have so much time that both me and the person I'm with can have the same time. We can meet, we can have our rackets, and we can play tennis on the tennis court. That's a different type of person. You're just, in my opinion, selecting for richer people. Okay, so this, the best sport for a long life, try tennis. It's like saying babies who ride home in the back of a Mercedes Benz do baby, better than babies who ride home in the back of a Toyota Yaris. It's just a socioeconomic marker. There's no way that tennis is better than biking or running or swimming. That's ludicrous to think. What are you doing in tennis that's any better? You're just working out, okay? It's just that not everyone can do it. This was Copenhagen, Denmark, and this was 1991 to 1994, followed for 25 years. Runners live longer than people who didn't go anything, and tennis players live way longer. It's like three times running. It's like some fountain of youth to play tennis. There's no good way to sort people who played multiple sports. They can't do that. There's no good way to adjust for hours versus the activity. And people who played tennis were younger and mostly wealthy, which is another difference, you know? So do you believe it? No. Then recently I was reading about all the things that the COVID-19 virus can do. And I was shocked to read, even mild COVID raises the risk of heart attacks and strokes. I was devastated. And then I saw COVID-19 can cause brain shrinkage and memory loss. And I was repeating myself to someone and then I thought maybe that's what happened to me. You know? And then I learned that the brain's not the only organ. It can shrink. It can shrink anything. Then I got real worried. <laughs> then I got really worried. All right. So, closing thoughts. Much of what we do in medicine, I think, is very valuable. I think, just yesterday, we were repleted iron in somebody who had iron deficiency anemia, and that's a very satisfying thing to do. They feel better. The iron goes up. You know, everyone's happy there. We extend survival for so many diseases. We provide comfort for people. We actually do the real part of medicine that doesn't come in a pill, which is caring about somebody. And I think that the oncology staff, particularly you all in this room, you probably do some of the most important stuff that we do here. It's not always the doctor. In fact, it's seldom the doctor, to be honest with you. The most important care is the real care that's provided. At the same time, I would, in this society, we would rather pay $300,000 a year of medicine than to get somebody more help around the house. That's a choice we make as a society. Our insurance company pays for one but not the other. Even the public systems of charity pay for one but not the other. We're not gonna send somebody to your house to take care of you, which is probably the best thing we could do. We give too many unproven drugs to people who are dying, and we do that instead of having honest conversations. We sequence tumors and we get results that don't make any sense and we just keep giving more unproven drugs. We screen people who just don't wanna be, they just wanna be left alone. They just wanna work on their car. We don't have to bother them. We don't have proof to bother them. We should just leave them alone. We churn out low credibility studies that COVID can shrink anything, that tennis players are better. You know, we churn out this garbage studies. We have like a, a, a society of researchers creating noise and we subsidize that with tax money while other people are actually doing some hard work. I find it crazy. So I do think we do great things. We should never forget that, but we do a lot of crazy things in medicine. So thank you all for your attention. We're gonna finish early. If you're interested in this, you can check out my YouTube channel. Got lots of videos on cancer drugs. There's a whole series about some of the drugs we're given. Um, I have a newsletter on drug development, but I should have put sensible. We have another newsletter called Sensible Medicine. It's like an online magazine. It's like for general healthcare audience. That'll be much more to your interest. I do this podcast called Plenary Session. It's kind of interesting if you're a nerd like this guy in the room. Uh, okay, I stop now. You know, you can find me on LinkedIn. You can always email me any questions and. I'm around, you know me, you see me around on the floors. I'll be back December on service. Thank you all for your attention.
Any questions? Comments? It's so nice out there. It's like 82, though. It's hot. Oh, you're just stretching. OK. Well, you can always email me or find me later. All right, thank you. Yeah, OK.